Hey everybody, welcome back to another lesson and today we are looking at the HbA1c test. If you know what this is, I'd still encourage you to watch this video just in case there's a couple of snippets of information that you didn't already know. And if you don't know what the HbA1c test, this test will be the foundation of contextualizing how well your diabetes is managed. Now there are certain pros of this test and there are some drawbacks which we'll be talking about. It's going to be quite a short lesson so without further ado let's jump in and check out what the HbA1c test is. The HbA1c test is a measure of how well your glucose levels have been managed over the previous three months and the reason we can do this is because what we can do is test how much glucose has stuck to your red blood cells in your blood over the previous three months. And the reason it's a three month blood test is because red blood cells last about three months in your body before they're recycled. So we can take a blood test and see at any given time how much glucose is stuck to those red blood cells. Now the result is slightly skewed to the previous month. So you'll have more of weight applied to the measure based on your most recent glucose levels as opposed to three months ago. But for ease, we say it's a three month blood test and actually that's a really nice way to think about it. So really all HbA1c means is hemoglobin, which is a crucial part of red blood cells, and A1c, which re represents the glucose element. So how much glucose sticks to the blood cell. Now in terms of targets for this figure, we now work in new figures, which is consistent with the European measures, which is millimoles per mole. Some of you may be familiar with uh, percentages that were previously used and you can use converters online to help you um, uh, move from percentages into millimoles per mole for the purpose of this video and it's because, because of what we use in practice now, we will be using millimoles per mole. So the target for uh, type 1 diabetes care in an ideal gold standard way is to achieve a result of 48 to 53 millimoles per mole. That is a really good place to be aiming. Not many people reach this in fairness and it's very hard to keep it that tight and that consistent. So actually we can open up that target and say anyone between say 48 and 58 or 59 is also doing really well and actually if I saw someone in clinic who came in with a HbA1c of 58, 59 I probably wouldn't bat too much of an eyelid. I think they're still doing great. And we also understand that diabetes is really hard to live with. So even if your glucose level is higher than this, it doesn't mean you're failing, doesn't mean you're doing bad. It's just about that's where you're at and where can we go from here. Now, as you get further away from 59, the higher you get, the higher your glucose levels will be, which will increase your risk of complications going forward. And also the longer you stay high, the more chance you have of complications forming. So a one-off HbA1c of say 100 isn't great, but if all the other times you're running between 48 and 53 throughout your life, that little blip's not gonna make a big difference. Whereas if you're perpetually running with a HbA1c of over 100, the risk of complications starts to stack up because your average glucose over your lifespan is much higher. So ideally, we wanna get as close to these figures as possible. Now you might be thinking, well, what if I get my HbA1c below 48? So actually get into more um, figures where you would see with people who don't have diabetes. So someone without diabetes, their HbA1c could be perhaps say in the 20s, in the 30s, or if you had type two, or if you're looking at type two diabetes, we're diagnosed pre-diabetes at 42 to 47. So that'd be your pre-diabetes with type two. Type one, that doesn't apply because you either have type one or you don't. There's no like um, gray area, so to speak. Um, but a 42 to 47, yes, you might actually have slightly better control than this 48 to 53, but there is a big drawback if you're trying to drive your glucose levels too low below this 48, and that is hypos. I've yet to meet a patient who consistently achieves a HbA1c below 48 who does not experience significant hypos quite regularly throughout the day. Now this is a risk because one, hypos are problematic in the day-to-day -day management, they're quite risky, they have complications in the sense that they can require third-party assistance, they can damage the brain activity, and also they just don't feel very nice and they throw your day out and often they result in a rebound high um, glucose level, which the whole point of this program is to stabilize your glucose levels. So if you're, if you're constantly correcting hypos and then correcting highs, you're gonna be locked into that pattern of persistently chasing the glucose levels. 
Um, the other thing is if you're persistently hypoing or driving the glucose levels too low, you lose a little bit of sensitivity to your hypo awareness and therefore you might not actually feel those hypos. So you don't feel like you're having hypos at all. But when we look at continuous glucose data, we can see that they are quite frequent. So clinically, a hypo is still a hypo even if you don't feel it, just because you've lost awareness, it doesn't mean it's not a hypo. And if that's happening too regularly, that's not without its own complications in the future. It can have a higher association with things like dementia and Alzheimer's and damage cognitive ability. So there's also long-term complications about low glucose levels. Now, I'm sure there's a few of you out there who managed to achieve HbA1c's below 48 without hypos, and I take my hat off to you because that's no easy feat. But as a general rule, if you're trying to drive it too low, you, it does come with additional hypos. And I'd also argue what additional benefit that's given you because a HbA1c of 48 to 53, even up to 58, 59, doesn't really put you at a great um, increased risk of complications compared to having a HbA1c below this. So we know our target ranges. Now, a couple of the drawbacks with this is, the HbA1c is obviously an average. So let's say you have two people, someone is roughly floating in here most of the time, between five and 10, the HbA1c is gonna be pretty good, they're gonna be in this target range. Meanwhile, you have someone else and they are floating up here quite regularly, between 15 and 20. Their HbA1c is gonna be quite high. And that's quite clear, so we can see that. And if we have access to their glucose data on a day-to-day basis, what they're seeing on the finger or the um, continuous glucose monitor or flash glucose monitor will correlate roughly with what the HbA1c is. Where it's not so clear is if you have someone that's a bit more inconsistent. So they tend to float between the lines like this. They're up and down. So actually this person might have a very similar HbA1c to someone that has a persistent glucose control of say 10, which again translates to pretty good control, but obviously this person is a lot more stable compared to this person, and this person would be at a lot higher risk of long-term complications compared to this person. So we do need to take HbA1c with a slight pinch of salt um, and actually look at the day-to-day -day glucose trends as well. So we're looking at a more holistic picture. Um, so that's a little bit about HbA1c. Now, one thing that you should do is if when you go see your diabetes team or your GP or your practice nurse, don't just settle for your glucose levels is good, your glucose levels is bad. Actually ask what the glucose level is, what the HbA1c result is, engage with it. Because if you know, you can contextualize it and then start to understand where you're at in terms of glucose control. And actually then if you improve it or it gets worse, you know how that relates to where you were at. Whereas throwaway statements like, you're good, um, doesn't really give you a number, so you can't measure it. And also, just because they think it's good, doesn't necessarily mean that that's where you want to be. So I really encourage you, find out where your glucose control is. You should get access to this test at least yearly. Some people will get it more regularly. There's no use in getting it more than every three months, because obviously it takes three months for these red blood vessels, uh, red blood vessels to recycle. So at least uh, as, a, as a bare minimum every, or a bare maximum every three months. But in reality, most people get it yearly and that usually suffices unless you're at particular risk um, and you're trying to see how certain changes to your diabetes treatment is working. Right, so we'll leave it there. And um, now that we understand this, we can start getting into a bit more the nitty gritty of how to level out those glucose levels. So we'll leave it there and I will see you later.